What's going on, people? It's your boy Kalechi back with another episode of the Rambling Mind Podcast. How are each and every single one of y'all doing today? I hope y'all are having a wonderful, 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 wonderful day today. We got a few things to get to. We got a few topics to hit on. We got some good news. We got some bad news, and we got some eh, okay news that we're getting that we're gonna be touching on throughout today. We got some news concerning the stock market, and we got some news concerning just like really bad news. Ten million people filed for unemployment in last week, and as we talked about, this number is just gonna keep going up. We got some news about the, the oil crisis with uh, OPEC and OPEC plus, basically the price war between uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia. And then we got some positive news about maybe we're just coming around the corner a little bit. Maybe we're rounding the bases. Maybe we're, some of these things are changing a little bit. So we got some positive news on that front. But before we get into any of that, uh, the last podcast we talked about, I told you I was going to do some sell-offs. I was going to sell some shares and look at investing in some new uh, companies and just raising some funds. So if we go to, let's go to message, actually let's go to the portfolio. So if you, you'll notice that a few shares are gone and then there's some shares that I've added in here. So for example, for, for the most part, some of the things that I sold out of, I sold, let's go to account, history. So I sold out of a few companies, as we talked about last time, I sold out of Uber, sold out of Nokia, sold out of Tanger Factory, uh, Tanger Outlet Factory, sold out of Zynga, and Fitbit. So I sold out of those ones because I was trying to raise some funds, uh, and plus some of them I just didn't believe in anymore. For example, Nokia has just been disappointing me, and Fitbit, I don't even know what they're doing. So I sold out of those funds, and I bought into some new ones. So some of the ones that I recently acquired where it was I bought another share of actually let's go back to the portfolio and if you're not watching this on YouTube I'm just gonna talk through what I'm showing everybody else I bought another share I bought another share of NRZ which is new realty yeah new residential investment it's a REIT it's a mortgage REIT it has a lot of uh, risk in it because right now a lot of people are not going to be able to meet their payments due to the whole coronavirus situation. However, overall, I like the way that they are as a company, the way that they balance their books, the way they operate as a company. And so I still believe that they can uh, they can do better in the long run. So I bought another share of, of new residential. And then I also bought another share of Ally, Ally Financial. Um, it was at the point when I bought it, it was about 10 bucks or something like that, $10 per share. And so uh, I bought another share of Ally, and basically it's just uh, I was trying to get more into the financial side of investing and trying to get more get my portfolio a little bit more diversified as far as when it comes to some of the financial sectors. There's some other ones that I am keeping an eye on, like Bank of America and those kind of companies. But Ally is one that I use day to day, and it's one that I have a very hands-on knowledge of. And even though it's not a very it's not been around for a long time. I think it's been around since 2015 is when it went public. But I think in that last time, it's shown its ability to grow and to develop and to have a diversified way of earning money and all that good stuff. So I bought another share of Ally, but I also made a purchase in oil. I bought a, a share of of Shell, of Royal Dutch Shell, uh, ticker symbol RDS.B. And so I bought that. Main, the main reason, I'm going to be honest, the main reason I bought Shell was mainly because they pay a ridiculously high dividend. Now, and sometimes that's a really bad thing, but in the oil industry, that's actually a normal thing for most oil companies to pay a high dividend. But the only thing with going with a company like Shell is that over time, oil companies are not exactly going to be your... Uh, how do I put this? I'm not exactly going to be the main force the main driving factor of any industry but shell has shown that they are willing to change and they are going to try and develop themselves into something else so for right now one of the biggest industries is oil however it's not going to always be that case but i just wanted to buy into shell at this point in time when they lost a good 
bunch of their value because they were about 60 something dollars at one point and so they've lost their value but the value is definitely going to come up so those those are some of the moves that i've made in my portfolio as you can see recently it's been going up and up and up but we'll talk about that and why in fact actually you know what? i think we should talk about that now this i don't think that we are completely out of the bear market the market started off this week with a lot of good news, a lot of really, really good news about are we are maybe coming out of this whole coronavirus situation when we started out this week. And it continued throughout the week where places like New York, places like Italy, places like Spain were recording drop-ins in the rate of new cases. So I'll read an excerpt from, the, from AP News. It said that the number of new coronavirus cases is dropping in the European hotspots of Italy and Spain. And in the center of the U.S. outbreak, New York also reported its number of daily deaths has been effectively flat for two days. However, this was written on, let me see, when was this? Uh, this article was written on Monday. Today, there was a completely different sentiment, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> effectively flat for two days. Even though the U.S. is bracing for a surge of deaths due to COVID-19, and New York's governor said restrictions to stay in place to slow the spread. The encouraging signs were enough to launch the S&P 500 to its best day in nearly two weeks. Uh, and Randy Fedrick, who is the vice president of trading and, trading and derivatives at Schwab Center for Financial Research, said, We're running on raw optimism. Maybe that's the best way to put it. The virus is not everything. It's the only thing and nothing else really matters to the market. Frederick told uh, the reporter of the AP Times. So, so the thing is, right now, because of those good news that we're hearing, because of the news of basically there's so much positive news coming out, you have China no, reporting no more deaths due to coronavirus, which is amazing to hear out of China. In fact, Wuhan, the center that where the COVID-19 originated, they've completely lifted all their travel restrictions. People are able to go in and out of Wuhan. People are able to get on public transportation again. However, they're still telling people, hey, just keep up social distancing, all that good stuff. But however, we're seeing like some of the lockdowns being taken away and the, the world kind of opening back up. And so that's all good news. We have so much good news coming out. However, the thing about that is it doesn't mean that the market, let's go back here, doesn't mean that the market is just going to continue going up. So recently, it's just, it's like people are like, oh, we're finally out of the bear market. We're finally out of the bear market. But if you remember, this happened, what was it, two weeks ago when this happened where we were like, oh, we're spiked to 20% up. And then all of a sudden, boom, it started dropping again. So don't, I'll say, don't just look at it and say, hey, we're out of it. We're done with it. As a matter of fact, there was an article I was reading. I'll read out snippets from the article. So it says that, uh, let's see, ever since the market bottomed and started moving higher, I've been working under the assumption that there will be a re retest of the lows. There's, that's largely because that's how the markets work. It sells off when a problem is first identifies, identified, rallies as the situation gets stabilized, and then falls again as the economic danger becomes clear. In other words, basically, it's just like that W pattern that I told you that I expect the market to be going through. It's basically the market will drop extremely whenever a situation first arrives. And then as things get clearer, it will go back up like we saw. It will go back up. But then it will drop again once we start getting earnings reports, once companies start actually revealing their financial situation and just how heavy the situation is, it will drop again. And then eventually it will start going back up. So... Right now, there's still a lot of doubt as to whether or not we're out of it. A quote from Nordi Nordia strategist Sebastian Galli, he said, there is a genuine shift from crisis to recovery. Example is New York may have plateaued. We are still very much in troubled waters, waiting for the second wave of the crisis to sink in. Household behaviors, behaviors, defaults on loans, and those kind of things. So there's still the other shoe that everyone is still kind of waiting to drop. Everyone is still nervous about how exactly is this going to play out. The uh, Bank of America, America strategist Carol Zhang is, uh, said in her, in a quote, In a few weeks' time, the world will, will still need to wrestle with the disruptions in everyday activities, supply chain hiccups, and social unrest around the world all hurting the labor market, consumer confidence, and investor risk appetite. 
Pricing is such a reality at, in such a reality means the lower for longer theme has just become lower for a lot longer. And U.S. yields could see a new low as a result of another risk of move. So basically, it's just we had a bit of a positive news with the fact that, hey, maybe coronavirus is finally plateauing. Maybe we're finally hitting the peak. However, we had some other news later on that came out and said we won't, probably won't see the peak of this till April 18th. So we had some news where it was like, oh, New York is doing well. You, New York is finally coming around the corner. However, today it was announced that New York saw its highest number of one-day deaths at about 470 pe 70 people died in one day from the COVID-19 situation. And so it's like we're seeing positive news and then there's some other not so positive news that's affecting the market as a whole. So it's hard to tell exactly which way we are, but I don't think that we are completely out of it yet, which is why I'll still say even even if we weren't out of it and even if we were out of it, I'll still say it's still a good time for you to buy. It's still a good time to invest. It's still a good time to look at some of the stocks that you may have had a, your eye on for a long time. For example, I'm still keeping my eye on some companies like Realty Income Corp. We have 3M. Uh, really, the next one that I'm probably going to buy is Comcast. I just think that Comcast is a resilient, even though it's an annoying, but it's a resilient utility company because in this day and age, internet is next to having power. Once you pay your power bill, you pay your internet bill. Everybody needs internet in this day and age. And so companies like Comcast, uh, Charter are basically almost utilities in this day and age. So that's another one that I'm keeping my eye on. CXS, I wish I had bought that, but I, I just don't have the capital to be able to invest in too many companies. So I'm very picky about which ones I'm going to invest in. So the next one for me that I'm probably going to acquire is going to be Comcast. And then after that, I'm probably going to chill and start adding on like multiple shares of Disney, multiple shares of Microsoft, multiple shares of, uh, of uh, Royal Dutch Shell. So just kind of doubling up and building up my portfolio. The other one I wanted to show y'all is my, oh man, it logged me out. Anyway, I was going to show y'all my M1 portfolio, but it logged me out. Basically, remember the last time I showed it, it had lost basically all the value that I put in there. I put in $100. In fact, you know what? I'm going to just, no, nah, I know I, I can't do it. But I put in $100 and that $100 turned to $90 like two days later. And then now it's up to $104. And basically that M1 portfolio is just to show you how, quickly in the middle of all of this things can change this is why i don't make investment choices based on the short term i look on the long term i look down the road and say hey how is this stock going to perform moving on into the future but anyway enough about talking about the stock market let's get into some news news uh things that not so great news some negative really negative news as of last week we had 10 million people who had filed for unemployment uh, I was reading an article from NPR and they said the number of people claiming unemployment benefits totaled a staggering 6.648 million last week, doubling the previous record that we set on Thursday of the week before that. And the number is just going to keep going up and up and up. Think about it this way. That is about 6%. That's 6 million or this 10 million that filed for unemployment, that have filed for unemployment due to this whole coronavirus situation is about 6% of the entire U.S. workforce. We keep breaking records in the wrong ways. We haven't broken these kind of records since 2008. And the, the negative thing is in the last two weeks, the job gains that we've made in the last five years have basically all been wiped out, like basically all been removed. Those 10 million people that have filed for unemployment. So also another part of this was the official payroll report was released last week or released. Yeah. End of last week. However, that only takes into account through mid March. And at that point in mid March, that was about March 16th. They said that unemployment was at 4.4%. And in February, remember unemployment was only at 3.5%. And we were raving about how good unemployment was about 701,000 jobs at that point in time had been lost due to this whole coronavirus situation. That number is expected to be in the millions in this month of April. It's expected to be extremely high due to everything that's going on with this coronavirus situation. However, the good news that came out of that, that people can kind of hold on to is most of these jobs are going to go right back 
once this situation settles down, once everything levels off, once companies can ca- kind of hire back those people that they furloughed or those people that they let go, which is great. However, and here's the negative part of that, various industries who have realized that they can run their operation with a minimum workforce are going to switch over to that. And some of those jobs may not be rehired when we come out of this whole crisis. So that's like, there's the positive side of it where like, we're going to be able to like get some jobs back. We're going to be able to get some positions back. We're going to be able to do so many different things once we come out of this. However, there's also the negative side of it that some industries is going to look completely different when we come out of this. And as we discussed last week, about 43 million people, the Fed is saying about 43 million people are probably going to file for unemployment through this whole situation. But as we talked about, it's not really affecting the market as much. Like that negative news of unemployment being extremely high is not affecting the market as much. And the main reason it's not affecting the market is the that has already been priced in. If we go and look at like the last one week, the amount, actually, you know what? We're going to just look up the S&P 500. I think that's the best thing to use as our, our radar. Nope, just S&P 500, not any ETF focused on it. I just want S&P 500. S and P 500 no so if you guys didn't know the S&P 500 stands for standards and pores I don't know why it's called standard and poor pores index which ugh, I can't find it but anyway basically this is also it's showing S&P 500 basically the news hasn't really affected the stock market as to like how negative things are overall like how much people are losing jobs and the main reason for that is the fact that That's already been priced in. Investors have expected that many millions and millions of people are going to lose their jobs, which is why we saw such a major sell off initially. And now they're slowly buying back into the market, slowly buying equity funds and equity stocks once again, and not just buying bonds and those kind of things. So they're slowly edging their way back into buying into the market. But it's still very, very much a negative news to read about how much people are losing jobs. And there was a quote that I saw reading NPR that was very important. This uh, Oxford Economics projects about 20 million people will lose their jobs in the coming weeks. And Goldman Sachs expects the economy to shrink at a rate of about 34 percent in the next quarter. That's just and that's unfortunate. However, Like I said, there is some good news. There is some good news on the other side of the fact that maybe we are finally rounding the corner. Like we're hearing about places like Spain and New York is finally coming around. And maybe we are seeing some of those uh, costs plateauing. Maybe we are seeing some of these things reverse reverse course and start going into the positive direction where people are all our efforts. I'll say you're part of this too. The fact that you stay home, the fact that you are washing your hands and you're practicing social distances and all these things is finally taking its effect and actually helping ensure that we are not remaining in this position that we've been for such a long time. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is Saudi Arabia and Russia and that price war. You know, it's been crazy, like buying gas for almost like a dollar, (laughs) a dollar for a gallon. It's been crazy how cheap oil has been because Saudi Arabia and Russia had been at a price war, but they finally agreed to come together and to talk This is after Donald Trump tweeted out and said that he had a conversation with Mohammed bin Salman, a.k.a. MBS, and he spoke and they spoke with Putin and they've agreed to about to reduce production by about 10 percent. So that's good. That's all like really good news about them finally coming together to try and help out the oil market, because so many oil companies, at least in the U.S., I know of that have already started looking at filing for bankruptcy because oil has just been extremely extremely cheap so with them coming together and saying hey we're gonna reduce our production by about 10 percent they were supposed to meet today when you're listening to this they were, they were supposed to meet so who knows if it's going to be delayed they were supposed to meet on tuesday but for some reason they didn't go down there was a delay and so it's been pushed all the way till to, to, to today so maybe we'll hear some good news as that as that whole thing goes into discussion and all that stuff but however the thing about that is it doesn't even matter as much if they came to their agreement about reducing um the supply of oil because the main thing is demand is extremely low as the international energy agency warned on friday that a cut of 10 million barrels 
per day would not be enough to counter the huge fall in oil demand. Even with a cut, in inventories will still increase by 15 million bar barrels per day in the second quarter. So basically, it's just basic, it's just simply put, we just are not going anywhere. Nobody's flying and airlines is one of the biggest demand for oil and nobody's flying anywhere. Nobody is driving anywhere. And so the only things that are really demanding oil and really is natural gas, to be honest, is uh, energy companies. Energy companies need, use a lot of natural gas. So oil is not having exactly a good time right now. It's not exactly a profit profitable industry right now, which is why they're trying to find ways to reduce the supply. Because as you all know, it's simple economics, supply and demand. It's if you want to reduce prices or if you want prices to go up, if demand is extremely high and supply is extremely low, demand uh, your prices are going to be extremely high. But if demand is extremely low and you have a whole lot of supply, prices are going to be extremely low. And that's just how it works. And so right now is that simple curve is playing itself out with the oil industry. Hopefully things are going to be coming, coming together and working out uh, as far as the oil industry is concerned. But anyway, the last thing I have for y'all is some of y'all may be wondering as we talked about Hey, are we like we, I've said multiple times, we may be rounding the corner. We may be coming out on the benefit, better side of things. I've said maybe we're finally seeing the good things to happen. So the question is, how will we know when it's time for the nation to reopen? There was a study done by several uh, health officials to, to kind of share what they are looking for to say, hey, it's time for us to go back to work. It's time for us to kind of go back to life as normal, life as we know it, life as we expect it to be. So there were four main things that they talked about that would be signs to say, hey, now we can start slowly going back to work, slowly opening up the country back up, slowly opening up the economy back up. The first thing is hospitals are in a state uh, hospitals in the state must be able to treat all patients requiring hospitalizations without resorting to crisis standards of care. Basically, think about what's happening right now. A lot of hospitals don't have enough materials to treat people. You know, masks, ventilators, they're having to be basically filled medics out there opening hospitals in whether it's auditoriums, opening hospitals in different uh courts, different stadiums, different things of that sort, because they're trying to find space to get people. You have manufacturers, car manufacturers creating ventilators. You have SpaceX creating ventilators. You have Apple creating masks. So that those are the type of things that are happening right now to be able to try and meet the standard of trying to care for people. And until we can have that under control where people can basically show up and get the proper treatment that they need, until we get to that point, we won't be able to come out of this whole uh, shutdown situation we're in. The other part of it is this, we have to get to the point where everyone is able to get tested for symptoms. And as of right now in the United States of America, we are nowhere close to that point. We're at about 750,000 tests a week, which is nowhere close to being able to test everyone for the virus to see if everyone has either the antibodies or even everyone is not doesn't have some kind of symptom or some kind of or nobody's asymptomatic for this for this virus and nobody needs to still be in quarantine and until we get to that point which is one of the things that south korea did and did so well was they were able to just do a, a lateral test all across the board where everyone was able to get tested and so we're not at that point in the united states it's in the united states at this point in time right now people who even are showing symptoms can't even get the test that's one of the problems that we're facing in a lot of places. Uh, Dr. Gottlieb, which is one of the people that was part of the study for this, said that this is uh, said that the 750,000 number should be viewed as a reasonable expe expectation for when we haven't been having any major pockets or regional outbreaks to manage. If more testing to help contain outbreaks and potential outbreaks is needed, which seems very plausible, especially early on, the number would need to be significantly larger. We'll also have to do some surveillance of people without symptoms, especially in higher risk settings. Think about big cities, New York, LA, Atlanta, your big city, Seattle, those kind of cities where people are condensed and there's a lot of people in those areas. The next thing that needs to happen is we have to be able to monitor and contain confirmed cases and who all they're coming in contact with. In other words, we have to be able to find a way to track people essentially and say 
who how are they who are they who have they come in contact with so we can get those people tested as well we have some countries that have relied on cell phone tracking to use for data i mean i've even heard of google uh allowing their their tracking and your location history to be used by the government so they can see who all have we been coming in contact with who may have this virus and how are we spreading it around and until we are able to do that we're not going to be going anywhere and then the last thing is there must be a sustained reduction in cases for at least 14 days and the reason is 14 days is because it can take up to two weeks for symptoms to emerge any infection that has already happened can take that long to appear and so until we get to the point where for a consistent 14 day period nobody is getting any new cases nobody is having any kind of is issues or situations where they're kind of fought, relapsing or anything like that which that's another fear that nobody's really talked about is the fact that it is very possible that so far it hasn't been the case but it is very possible for somebody to recontract the disease and that's something that they are watching out for as well so those are the four things again i'll just review the four things that have been stated that we need first of all we need hospitals to be able to treat all patients without any kind of crisis standards uh we have to be able to test everyone who has symptoms first of all at least test everyone who has symptoms and then we have to be able to conduct and monitor confirmed cases and all the places that they come in contact with and then we have to have a reduction in cases for at least 14 days so when we get to that point when we are able to get to the point where we know hey we are making progress all these criteria, and then the world will be able to open back up we'll be able to go back outside and everyone who likes to be outside and everyone who likes to be social can go back to being social. I'm not in that world. I'm very much not the most social person. I'd rather stay home than be around a whole lot of people all the time. But that's just me. Everybody else is different. But yeah, so these are things that we have to meet to be able to meet that criteria. But anyway, I hope y'all learned one or two things throughout this whole thing. I hope y'all caught a message or two throughout this rundown of information about the the whole coronavirus situation and i hope y'all are keeping your head up i hope y'all are focusing on the fact that we will get out of this yes it's tough right now but we will definitely get out of this and y'all just keep washing your hands keep staying safe and i'm gonna do a quick review of everything that we talked about we started off with the fact that we had over 10 million people file for unemployment and it's just I mean, we're breaking all kinds of records in the negative ways. We talked about the fact that Russia and the and the and Saudi Arabia finally decided to be like grown men and come to the table and have a discussion about what to do about the oil crisis. We talked about how we might just be rounding the corner, we might just be coming around the corner, and how the stock market responded to that positive news. And then we talked about even though that news is positive, it doesn't mean that we are out of troubled waters completely. Just be mindful, be careful. We may be coming out of this, but we're not completely out of this just yet. And then finally, we talked about the four things that we have to meet in order for us to say, hey, we can finally come out of this. Hey, we're free to come out and go outside and play again and go to work and sit in an office and not work from home. Yeah. But anyway, that's all I got for y'all today. I hope y'all learned a thing or two like i said before and i hope y'all are keeping your head up focus on the light at the end of the tunnel it may be hard but there is hope that there's always a better tomorrow but anyway i'm gonna catch y'all on the next one god bless each and every single one of y'all and wash your hands peace